Hi, today we're going to be looking at the Explorer portion of our learning site. Um, so you can go into any of your Explorer courses. Um, you will have an icon for each of the different classes that you are teaching. Today I'm going to go into my Spanish 1 Explorer course. When you go into the Explorer course, you're going to land on the Content tab. This Content tab is where everything is kind of housed. I equate that Content tab to that big box of ancillary materials I got the last time I adopted a textbook. It was that big box I got with all of the different workbooks and the CDs and the DVDs and all of those pieces that I needed to help me teach. All of that basically is what this content tab is. It's where all of those resources are organized. You're going to notice that the organization of these folders are set up just like your textbook. Um, so there is a folder for each unit. So let's go ahead and click on Unit 1. When I do that, I'm going to see that Unit 1 folder is now organized into subfolders by each section in the textbook. So it aligns with the table of contents. And you notice the page numbers here to help you identify which section you want to go to. So let's say I want to go to the Comunica section, which is where all the Así se dice vocabulary and the Observa grammar resources are. I can click on that, and once again, I'm going to see folders for each part of the Comunica section. So if I know I want to go to the vocabulary section, the first vocabulary section on page 45, I know that resource is going to be in this folder. So let's go ahead and click on it, and you're going to see all of the different resources available to me for that particular section. Um, since we're in this folder, let's go ahead and look at what these different icons mean so you know what the different types of activities are. First of all, this um, icon that looks like a stack of note cards are flashcards. Um, these are interactive flashcards that you can assign to your students. Um, you'll see that they have an image or a Spanish word on one side and the Spanish equivalent on the back Many of the flashcards also have an audio file that you can hear the words being spoken. I can advance to the next um, card as well. Students can also mark those cards as learned. Um, and that will essentially take it out of their stack so they're practicing the ones they don't know. So those are the flashcards and that's what that icon means. I'm going to go back to my CCDC folder and look at the next icon. Here we see a stopwatch with a question mark in it. This icon indicates that it is an online activity that can be graded. You may see reference to the word quiz in the learning site, and um, that word quiz just refers to any type of online activity that can be graded. It's not necessarily a quiz like you and your students might traditionally think. It's an online graded activity. And there are different types of quiz activities. Let's go in and look at a few of those activities. So here we have one that goes with, um, so it's an online activity that goes with Actividad 3, Quien Soy. And I have some different options here. I can preview the activity, which uh, shows me a quick glimpse of what that activity is going to do. It's not interactive, but I can go ahead and look at it. I can attempt it, which allows me to try out the activity as if I were a student. I have the option to see the grades uh, for my students who have completed this activity. I can assign this activity to my students from right here. I can share it to Google Classroom by using this button. And I can change the settings uh, for this one particular activity if I want them something different from my regular default settings. So let's just go into the preview and get a quick glimpse of what this Actividad Tres Quien Soy is. I do know it goes with that activity in the textbook, so I can also open up my textbook to see what this activity is about. So I'm going to click on Preview, and here I can see, oh, it must be a listening activity because here's a listening file. Um, I can listen to that file here. Quien Soy? Look at the photograph. Okay, so I can listen to the file. Um, then I see the pictures that are associated with this activity, and then I see that it um, students are identifying the picture that goes with each statement made in that audio file. In the preview, I also see the answers for each one. If I know that I want my students to do this activity from looking at this preview, I can click the Assign button from right here and assign it to my students. 
I'm not going to do that quite yet, however. So I'm going to go back. Let's say I need some more information about this activity. I'm going to click Attempt, and that allows me to try out the activity. When you click Attempt, or when your students click Attempt to do an activity, you're going to see the settings for that activity. You can see I am allowing them three attempts. The passing grade is 60, and there is just one question for this activity. So I'm going to go ahead and click Start to do it. And now I can, once again, listen to that file. And as I'm listening to it, I can go down and actually do the activity. Um, just to save some time here, I'm just going to click on some random answers. I don't know what the correct answers are. We'll see how well I can guess. So let's say that um, you actually listened to it, you completed it. Now you're ready to submit it. When you or your students click Submit, you'll always be prompted to make sure you really do want to submit it. I'm going to click OK. And now I see that, oop, I didn't guess very well. I got zero correct. Um, the red bar indicates that I did not pass. That status is also here. So I did not reach that 60% threshold I had set for my students. Um, if I want to see which ones I got right or wrong, in this case, I got them all wrong, but let's say I actually got some correct, I can click on the question and the students are going to see their answers. Their answers will be color coded. They're marked red if they're incorrect, and they'll be marked green if they are correct. Since I'm in here as a teacher currently, I can also see the correct answer. So if I want to compare what my students entered with what was the actual response, I can check that as well. Here, the grade automatically, the computer automatically graded this assignment. Um, any type of objective activity. So for example, this one where you're, um, it's multiple choice with uh, different pictures, whether it's true and false, um, fill in the blank, matching, any of those objective type activities, the computer automatically grade, grades and gives this immediate feedback to the students. So they can go in and relearn what they didn't know and try to improve on their second attempt. So the grade that the computer assigns, it's just a percentage uh, based off of how many they got right um, out of how many points possible is going to show up here. You can always override that. So let's say your school has a, po a no zero policy so that the lowest grade they're going to get is a 50. You can go in and change that to a 50. You can also type some feedback here like use the flashcards to practice some more. Whatever comments you want to make to the students, like writing that note on the top of your student's worksheet. And you click Save. Your answers are graded. And students will get now get a notification up here in this bell next to their name when they go into the learning site to tell them that they have an assignment that's been graded. Okay? So um, up here, you can see what are called my breadcrumbs. That tells me where I've been so far in the learning site. And I can use this back arrow to go back a page, back a page, back a page, or I can just use my breadcrumbs to quickly go back to where I was. So I want to go back to that Assise Dice folder where I had a list of all my activities, okay? Um, and we were looking at this one here, Actividad Trace. So I, we previewed it, we attempted it. Um, let's go ahead and say we liked that activity and now we want to assign it. I can go to the Assign button here, or if I click on the activity, there's also an Assign button here. Okay, so anytime you want to assign anything in this Content tab, you click Assign, and you will get a list of all your classes and students. I only have one Spanish 1 class um, in my courses, but if you had, for example, three Spanish 1 classes, you would be able to uh, assign this to all three classes at once. Not only can you um, assign it to just one or to all of your classes, you can differentiate which students you assign it to. So for example, if Seth is doing really well with vocabulary, but Jennifer and Ozma are still struggling, maybe I'm only going to assign this activity to those students who need that extra practice. But for the sake of this, let's say I'm going to assign it to everybody. I click Next Step, and now I can set the due date. So I can just click on my calendar and let's say I want it due Friday and let's say class is over at 
3 o'clock. So I can assign it due Friday at 3 o'clock. I can click Assign Now, and my students will get a notification and that little bell by their name saying they have a new assignment to do. Um, there's another feature in the assign, assigning portion that's called Assign with Delay. If I want to, for example, if I'm planning on a Sunday night and I'm planning out for my classes for the week, or if I'm planning um, to have a sub on Friday, let's say, and I don't want this assignment to show up until Friday, but I want to get it done now, I want to get it in the system, I can do what's called assign with delay. So I have in my due date when I want it done. So for example, maybe three o'clock is the time class is over on Friday. So I can assign this with delay, and I can put in Friday at 2 o'clock. Let's say class starts at 2 o'clock. I want this assignment to show up to my students at the beginning of class time on Friday, and they have all class period to do it. Um, it won't show up to the students in before 2 o'clock on Friday, though, because I'm assigning with delay. So if I click Assign with Delay, it says the assignment was created but it has not yet shown up to the students. They won't receive that notification until Friday at the time I assigned it to be shown. Um, so let's go back to the CCIDSA folder and look at some of those other types of quiz activities. So we saw that one. Let's go ahead and look at this quiz activity. Let's just do the preview of it. So we can see um, this is a fill in the blank. So these boxes means uh, these are the answers the students would type. So they're going to choose the correct answer. Lionel Messi, and is he a cyclist or a soccer player? So they're going to type in S futbolista. Pablo Picasso, is he an artist or an athletic trainer? He is, Pablo Picasso es artista, etc. So you can see an example of a short answer that's an objective activity because there is a correct answer. And then the computer would grade this for the students immediately and give them that feedback. Um, let's look at another type of activity. This one here is called extension. So let's look at the difference between the ones that say extension and that do not. These activities here, Actividad 3, page 42, um, and here, Actividad 7, those, oh, that one actually says extension as well. Um, the ones that say extension are activities that are not in the textbook. These are those extra workbooks activities. Um, these are the activities that provide extra practice for your students above and beyond what is already provided in the textbook. So here are this extension dos. Let's preview that and see what this is. And this is a matching one. In the preview, I'm seeing um, just the answers matched across. Um, let's go ahead and look at what happens when I attempt that one. When I attempt it, um, the answers are now mixed up, and I click on the one side and click on the other to draw the line. Okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and get two of those wrong. Wow, I'm going to get more than two of those wrong because I <laughs> messed those up. So let's say those are my answers. I'm going to submit. Yes, I'm ready to submit. I see there were two other questions that I didn't complete, but hopefully our students completed all. I'm going to see once again, I didn't pass because I only did one of the three sections, but let's look at that one section. I can see which ones I got right and which ones I got wrong. Students um, do have to go on to learn the vocabulary. Um, so the next attempt, the options are actually going to be mixed up in a matching. And also if it's like a multiple choice. The answers will randomize and be in a different order so that students can't just remember the order of the answers. Um, let's go back using the breadcrumbs to the Asisa folder. So that's just a taste of a few of the objective type activities. We will look at the subjective speaking and writing activities in a moment. So I'm going to scroll down. You can see there's lots of different extension, those extra practice activities. Um, and then we have a couple file different icons here. This icon is the same for both of these. It looks like a piece of paper. Um, but it, we're going to notice it's for two different types of files. Normally, this icon is going to indicate it's a PDF file. So let's click on this one. And you'll see the PDF opens actually in a new tab. 
Okay, anytime you have a PDF, it will open in a new tab. Um, and you will also notice that some of these boxes are kind of gray in color. And that means students can go ahead and type in those gray boxes and write an answer. Um, so maybe I was talking to Paul on this and I say, Paul, no es guitarista. I can write down his response. And maybe the next one I talk um, to Lola. Guitarista. Um, so I can write the responses there as I'm typing. So with the PDF, students are able to type right in the PDF. If you want, if you're in a face-to-face -face classroom, you can download this PDF and print it out as a worksheet and make photocopies for your students. If your students are in class and have one-to-one -one devices, there no, there's no need to make that photocopy. They can do this on their one-to-one -one device. Um, if you're teaching virtually, students can also do this on their own devices at home. Um, what I would always recommend is telling your students to first download that PDF. So if they go up here to the top right corner of the PDF, they have that option to download. And then they're going to um, use the naming conventions that you've told them to use, maybe their last name plus the name of the activity or whatever way you want them to identify the different activities. And then they're going to save it to wherever they save their electronic documents for your school, whether that's on the desktop, on the, in their file, on the school server, in their Google Classroom folder, wherever they save their documents. Um, that way, once they save it, anytime they add to it and type to it and then click save, it will save all their work. If they go ahead and fill this out and forget to do a save as before or to download before they type everything in, there is a workaround. You can use this button up here to do a file, um, a print save as PDF. So if they choose that option, instead of sending it to a printer to print out and choose the save as PDF option, you can see it will save their answers there as well. So all of the PDFs in this program are um, typable where students can write on them, save their answers, submit them electronically. Let's go back to the learning site. Um, so that is what this icon normally means, that it's a PDF. In the level one series, in the level one textbook of the series, there are also some PowerPoints uh, for the vocabulary. So that icon could also mean a PowerPoint file. If it does say PowerPoint and you click on it, it will automatically download to your computer wherever you have your downloads uh, go to. And then you're able to open it up and work with that PowerPoint just like you do any PowerPoint. This file here. Um, is an audio file. Let's go ahead and click on it. Notice it says audio only. This is not an activity that goes with the audio, it's just the audio file. Think of it as your CD and it's a track from the CD. Um, you can play that. Soy bilingüe. Me gusta. Or you can download it. If you download it, you can save it to your desktop, for example, if you need a substitute to have access to it for an activity while they're with your students. You could download it and upload it to your LMS, however you want to use that file. Um, notice there's that assign button there that I can assign it to my students. If I want them to listen to this for homework, I can assign it. I can also share it to Google Classroom. Anytime you see that share button, you click it and it will connect to Google Classroom if you are using that uh, with your students. So let's go ahead and go back to, we go back to the Comunica folder and go into a different folder from what Cisse dice. Let's go into the Observa, the grammar folder. Um, I can see there are a lot of activities to practice that grammar concept. I can see that um, there are some PDFs available to me. And now I have this new icon here, which is a video file. So just like the audio file we looked at, here I can watch the video. I can make it full screen if I want. In this option, I have picture in picture, so I can take it and move it anywhere on my screen that I want. 
if the video has subtitles, and those subtitles would be in Spanish, and these would be, for example, like with the video bloggers, I can show you an example of that, there would be an option to do subtitles here as well. Just like the audio files, I can download it if I want to, and then use that file, you know, leave it on my desktop, put it in my Google Classroom, wherever. Um, let's go back and I'm going to show you one of the video bloggers and I think this one actually Let's try it see what happens. So I have the video here. Oh Here we go. It does have it. So here we see captions off captions on so if I want to show this video Let's watch it first without Hola, mi nombre es María Laura. Tengo 17 años. Soy if I want to show it with captions, if I think that's going to be a support for my students, I click captions on and now you can see it has it in Spanish for you. The captions are only in Spanish, not in English. Um, let's go back. There is one other type of um, icon I want to show you and that is this icon here. This is a discussion forum icon. And it's like a chat room for your students. I actually have a chat room, um, not a chat room, but an activity set up in that chat room. So I want to show you that completed one um, first. And I think it's right here. So let's go ahead and go to this activity. And you can see what those chat rooms look like. So here it's related to uh, uh, Encuentro Intercultural in the textbook on page 232. So this is the text from part of that um, cultural note. And here it's talking about the difference between Spanish and Mexican tortillas and students are asked to compare their preferences. So they do this in this chat room. Um, notice the different ways students can interact in this chat room. They can type a message and this chat room works just like Facebook Messenger or WhatsApp, any social media platform that your students are used to, where someone can post, others in the group can reply or can put up their own post. So here, Jennifer was the first one to type in and she's saying that she likes um, potatoes um, or that Spanish tortillas have potatoes, Mexican tortillas are more like bread and she likes the Spanish tortillas better. Um, but then Seth thought he was being funny. He actually added this image, money can buy me happiness. <laughs> it's called tacos. So you can add images to this chat. You can type your messages. You can add images. You can add videos. Here a student found, Asma found a video that was related to the topic and added that to her chat. Um, you can see someone added a link here. Uh, someone added a picture of a cat and said, I like cat tacos. So there's different ways to interact with this chat. Um, notice here. I went in and did an audio response, or actually a video. ¿Qué? ¿No te gustan los tacos? ¿Estás loco? So students can create a video or an audio response or post as well. And to do that, all they do is click down here. And if they want to upload a file, like if they want to upload a PDF or an infographic or something, they could do that there. They can add their video recording by just clicking and then click again and start audio recording. They start speaking. When they're done speaking, let's just do it. So let's click start. Now it's recording everything I'm saying so that my comment will be an audio file for my classmates to listen to. When I'm done, I click stop. It'll take it a minute and there's my file to post. Works the same way with the video that we just saw up there. This is where students, oops type their messages to include. Here's where they can embed videos, um, add a link to a video. Um, they can copy and paste those images right here in the box. You'll notice if I hit post, now there's my typed message and my audio message that students can respond to. So that's kind of how that discussion forum works. It's a fun way for students to get interpersonal practice outside of class. Um, so that's kind of the organization of the uh, folders. Let's go back to the folder. And we can see all the different sections. For example, here the Vida Entre Culturas is the summative assessment for this unit. I can click on that. 
and I can see the resources that I need for that folder. Um, so that's the content tab. I'm going to go into the settings tab right now. Let's say I want to change my settings. Remember earlier when we went in and clicked on uh, activity and it said my students had three attempts? That's the default, but you can set those attempts to whatever you want. So let's look at the different things you can change the settings for. The first setting you can change is for a late penalty. So if a student does an assignment online but does it late, do you want a late penalty or no? You can turn that on or off with that button. If you turn it on, you decide what percentage of points they're going to lose for turning it in late. I'm just going to go ahead and turn it off for now. Um, here's where you're going to set the number of attempts. If you want, you can set it to 5, to 3, to 100. You can choose the number of attempts your students will get with that activity. And remember, this is the default. So this is what students are going to have unless you change the settings for the individual activities themselves. Um, down here, you can see some activities that I have changed the settings for. So I have my settings set to five attempts um, with a passing grade of 70. And here um, is one where I actually changed it to three attempts and a 60% passing. Um, here is one where I said they had to get 100% on the activity, but I gave them 99 attempts to do so. So you can change um, the settings. You set your default and then you can change it for individual activities. How to change it for an individual activity? Let's go into one of our folders. And you'll see here on the activity that it says setting on the far right side. I can click that and that's how I'm going to change the settings for just that one activity. So if I don't want to use the defaults, I click that button and I change it to the passing grade is 100 and they get 100 attempts, whatever I want. And that a passing grade is required for them to complete it. The other settings available for you are the show hide content. By default, students see everything in the learning site that you see. Okay. Um, there is one folder in the resource folder that we'll look at that students don't have access to. It's called uh, Solo para Profesores. But other than that, they have access to everything in these folders. So if you remember, I showed you they have access to the summative assessment resources. That would in the textbook they see a brief description of the activity, but online or yeah online they're going to have a PDF with more of the details, the specifics of that assessment. For example, there might be a PDF with the reading in it and the comprehension questions um, or comprehension tasks. There, um, if it's an interpersonal email writing, it would have the email they're responding to and the template they're using. If it's a presentational speaking, it would have the checklist of everything they need to include. If it's a video or an audio, that would be in that file as well. And we may not want students to have access to that before the day of the assessment. So what we can do is click on the box and now it's unchecked. If it's unchecked, that means it is wiped out of the student's um, interface. They do not see that folder at all. Um, Notice what happens on your folder. Let's go to the content tab and go to unit one. Notice what happened on yours. It turned this gray color instead of black like the rest of the text. That's a reminder to you that your students don't have access to this folder currently. And when you want them to have access to it, you need to go back to the settings, go to show hide content, and give them the access back by checking on it. Another way teachers use this show hide feature is sometimes teachers will only show students the one chapter they're working with. That way they don't get lost in clicking around. So you can uncheck an entire folder and then those folders are um, not visible to your students as well. And to you they would be grayed out to remind you that when you get to unit two, you need to unhide it for your students. Um, let's go to the Assignments tab real quick. 
and let's look at what is all here for you. Your assignments tab is going to have a list of all of the assignments that you have assigned to your students. Okay. When you open your assignment tab, it opens in this list view. Notice you have this view as option, list or calendar. The teacher default is list. The student default, however, is calendar. So when students open their calendar view, this is what they see. Notice these um, assignments that are in this dotted line. That tells me they're assigned with delay. So students don't see those yet. Come Thursday, this will turn gray just like all these other activities that I have assigned um, are. Let's go back to the list view. I think that's just a little easier to see what information we have. All this information is also available in that calendar view, but you have to do a little more clicking. Um, so here I can see the activity title. If I want to go to the activity, I can just click on that title. I see the path of where that is located. I have the assigned date, the day I assigned it, and you can see that I have a couple delayed assignments here. I see the due date and time. Here, this just gives me a little visual about how many days left till it's assigned or till it's due. I can see I have a couple that are due on Friday, one that's due tomorrow, one that's due today. Here's some that are overdue. Um, let me see the rest of my information here. I can see how many students I assigned it to and how many have completed it. If I want to see names, for example, let me scroll down. For this one here, if um, it says I have one student who's completed it and I've assigned it to three, I can click on students and it will show me who has completed it. So here I see that Seth has already completed that activity. If I want to look at his results on it, I can click view results. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to do that right now though, so I'm just going to close out of it. This yellow dot next to where it says students tells me that there is that I need to go in and grade this yet. Um, that there was some type of subjective activity, speaking or writing, that the computer wasn't able to grade on its own that I need to go in and give feedback on. And then the edit button here will allow me to change the due date or to change who I've assigned it to. So for example, if I have a student who was gone this day, I can unassign that from her and then reassign it to her with a different due date. Or if I had a snow day and I want this due a different day, I want to give them one more day to do it, I could have it due on the third or the fourth or whenever I want. So I can edit that information from the assignments tab as well. Um, up here you have a few more options with your assignments. I can add another assignment from right here. Remember when we were in that content tab, we were able to add assignments from there. I can also add assignments from here. If I click add assignment, I will see the list of chapters, the sections in the chapters, each, um, so I can navigate. And if I already know which activities, if I've been looking through these and I'm making a list of which ones I want to assign, this is a faster way to assign multiple activities at once. I can just click on the ones I want to assign and they pop up over here. I can also unclick them, they disappear, okay? I can do a double click on that and it pops up as well. So I can do the check mark or I can double click or I can just click and drag it over. So whatever way is easiest for you, you choose the activities and then click next step. And then you go through the assignment, the signing of it like you have for the other activities, choosing your students, choosing the due date. Notice it even tells you if you've already assigned this to your students once before. Let me go ahead and cancel out of that. Um, sometimes this list gets really long. You know, can you imagine if this is all of your assignments for the entire year? That might get a little overwhelming for both you and the students. So you can archive assignments as you go. Perhaps after each unit, you can archive the assignments from that unit um, so that the list starts over and is fresh for the upcoming unit. When you archive, um, you can click any assignments that you want to archive, or you can click them all if you're like doing it at the end of a unit, for example. And then you click Archive Selected. Let's just say I want to archive just this one here. 
Um, it tells me I have one selected and I want to archive it. I can go ahead, click archive. It's asking me if I really want to, and I say yes. And so now that's gone from my list. But if I need to go back to it, if I want to check my students' records on that, check their grades, if I need to go back for any reason, I can just click show archived. And those, there are all my assignments. I can even unarchive it if I want. Okay. And the remove button works the same way. If I if I created an assignment and now I decide no, I want to remove that assignment from my students list, I just go to remove selected and choose one that I want to delete. Let's say I want to delete this assignment. And I go up and I click Remove Selected, and it tells me I've selected one, just as a reminder, making double checking before I get rid of it. Once I remove it, it is gone forever. I cannot retrieve it, so keep that in mind. If you think you might want it in the future, archive. If you know it was just assigned incorrectly, you can click the Remove button. There we go. Okay. Um, so those are your options here on the um, assignments tab. So let's um, say we have an assignment that we've given that is a speaking or a writing assignment that we want to give feedback on. How do you give that feedback? It's one of the, my favorite features of our learning site. There's a lot of great things, but this is one of my um, favorites. So I'm going to show you how to do that. I'm going to look first here at this activity, um, it's called an email to the city of Mexico. I'm gonna open that up and I'm going to attempt it. So you can see first how students would complete this writing activity and then how you would give them feedback on it. So let's go ahead and start. I can see the prompt here and this text box. Students are going to read the prompt and we're going to start typing their email response here. So they're gonna type, when they're done answering all of this prompt, they can go ahead and click Submit. It's gonna make sure that they really do wanna submit. I'm gonna say yes. And now, when you go in, you'll get a notification up here saying that Seth submitted his writing and you will get that green attempt link. But being I'm in the teacher account, it just opens me up to the activity. I click on it, and what, here I see the prompt that he talked about, and I see his answer. To give feedback, all you have to do is highlight. You can highlight a word, a phrase, as much or as little as you want. When you highlight something, you have the option of using different colors. And then you type your feedback here. So any, you know, for example, if they said, yo tengo una familia grande, writing about their family, and you want more information about that. How many brothers and sisters do you have? You could say, give me more details, for example. Um, in this particular one, talking about food, maybe you want, they talk about one food, maybe you're going to encourage them with some feedback to talk about another food that they like or don't like. Um, you could also, let's save that, and Let's say here they type something and you want to make another comment in a different color. You can add more feedback. Any type of feedback you want, you can add. As much or as little it, that is needed. I've had teachers tell me they use this uh, feedback or this highlighting option and come up with a color coding system. So for example, maybe purple means tell me more and pink means I don't understand and blue means um, there's a grammar area here, try to figure it out. So they come up with a color coding system, and then when they highlight, they highlight it in the color of the error. But the trick here is you have to have some kind of note. So I tell teachers just put a period there, and then they can save their note, and students can just look at the color and uh, figure out what their error is. So when they go back to do their second attempt at this email writing, they can improve upon what they did the first time, make those corrections. Once again, you can add your grade here. 
And then you can type an overall global comment about their work. You click save. And now um, students get a notification in their bell saying they have feedback. They go in, they're able to click on each piece of highlighting and read what you wrote. So that is how you give feedback on a subjective writing activity. Let's look at feedback on a subjective speaking activity. Um, and for example, I think this one is a speaking, this extension activity is a speaking activity. Um, so I can go down and attempt it. and click start. And here I have my prompt. It says, listen and respond to Araceli's questions about the food people typically have for breakfast, lunch, or dinner in your community. Include a variety of food items in each answer. So when I click start audio recording, I'm gonna hear Araceli's prompt, and then I will be able to answer her question or questions. So let's go ahead and do that. ¿Qué desayunan típicamente las personas en tu comunidad? ¿Y qué almuerzas tú en la escuela en un día típico? ¿Cuáles son algunas comidas que la gente come en la cena en tu comunidad? So now students would start responding to those three questions, talking about what they eat for breakfast, what they eat for lunch at school, and what a typical dinner is like. When they're done speaking their response, they click Stop Audio Recording. And their file will pop up. I always encourage my students to listen to it. ¿Qué desayunan? Um, to make sure it did record. If they can hear their response, students would start responding to those three questions. If they can hear the response, they know it did get recorded. Um, and they, if they're happy with it, they can click submit. Okay. So they hit, if they're not happy with it, they can click start audio recording again and re-record it. Let's say we're good with it, we're gonna click submit. So I would get that notification saying the student submitted their activities with the link to it so I can go listen to it. But since I'm already here, you'll see the prompt they spoke to and then you'll hear their answer. Okay, so this one was like a simulated conversation. So we know that first 20 seconds is just the prompt of the artist Sally's questions, right? So when I'm listening, maybe I want to scroll ahead so I don't have to listen to that same prompt 30 times. So after the first time, I'm going to jot down that, oh, at 18 seconds, that's where the students start speaking. So I don't have to re-listen to that prompt over and over again. Um, as I'm listening, so now students would start responding. I can click that add a comment button right there. I can click this button as many times as I want or need to to leave feedback. And I can leave that feedback two different ways. Notice that when I click that, it stopped the recording and it stopped it at 21 seconds. So that feedback is timestamped. And students get that timestamp with their feedback so they know where in their recording this comment refers to. So I can type a comment here. So I can leave a written comment as feedback. I can go back and listen to those three questions, talking about what they eat for breakfast. I can add another comment. This one here is time, time stamped at 24 seconds. But it says I can also leave a voice comment. To do that, I'm going to go to the far end of the bar and there's a microphone. Once I click that microphone, it starts recording what I'm saying. So if I click that, notice it turns red and it says recording. So now this is my oral feedback to my students. Great for pronunciation, for modeling word order, for example. Or if you just speak faster than you type and you can give more feedback more efficiently by voice comments, you can use that. When you're done, click the microphone and now your comment has turned to a link so that when students see your feedback, they can read some feedback and here they can click this. Notice it turns red and it says, and they can listen to your feedback as well. Um, here you type in your the grade based on the rubric you're using. Any global comments here? about the assignment, click save. Students get that notification saying you have graded their assignment. They can go in and look at it then.
Um, so we've looked at the assignment tab. We've looked at how to give feedback on suggestive activities. We've looked at settings. Um, we have just a few more things to look at. Let's go back to the content tab, the very beginning where we started. You're going to notice there is this folder called Recursos. This is a folder that both you and your students have access to. And it is all the banks of resources that are available for your students. Um, you'll see this folder here, we'll come back to this one. It's called Solo Para Profesores. Your students do not have access to that one. Um, but they do have access to all of the rubrics. They have access to the bank of graphic organizers, to maps. Here, this uh, folder has links to, let's go ahead and open it, links to the PDFs of the different can-do statements for the different units. So if your students are doing their portfolio via paper instead of the online version, or if they do it on paper first before the online version, that's where the PDFs of those are. There are other resources such as links to online dictionaries, links to music videos, links to news sites. Um, and then here we have links to videos that go along with the grammar and the learning strategies for all three levels of the textbook. So these are banks of resources that you and your students can use. In this folder, the Solo Para Profesores, these are resources that are going to help you as a teacher. You have the midterm and final exam materials. These are not exams in and of themselves. These are tasks in the different modes of communication for each unit. Um, so midterm covers units one through three, final covers units four, five, and six. And you'll see if you open that up, but there is a whole list of different performance-based tasks that you can mix and combine to create your midterm or final exam. For example, if you want to do an interpersonal task from Unit 1, and then in Level 2 you want to do an interpretive task, for example, and in Unit 3 you want to do a presentational speaking task, you can uh, pick and choose the tasks you want to do. So that's that folder. Let's go back to the Solo Para Profesores and see what else is in there. Um, we have all of the answer keys, so PDFs with the answer keys, and with the transcripts of the audios and videos. Um, proficiency resources are a new, is a new folder that we have, and currently the resource that is in there are proficiency trackers. These are great self-reflective tools for your students that you can share with them where they are looking at their performance on their assessments, whether it's the formative in Camino or the summative um, IPA Vive Entre Culturas, looking at the different modes of communication and tracking their proficiency level. And then we're doing a little bit of reflection. What did they do that they're proud of? What kind of, what part of their learning are they really proud of? What do they still need to improve on? And then what did they do that help, really helped them learn this unit? So just doing some great student self-reflection. And um, we'll be adding more resources to this folder as we come up with those. So that is the Solo Para Profesores folder um, in the resources folder. I think I just have a couple other things to mention and um, we'll be done here. So I've already talked a little bit about this notification bell that will let you and your students know when either you will find out when students have turned uh, assignments in and students will be notified when you have given feedback on assignments or when you have assigned something to be done. This bottom green button where it says need help is available to both you and your students as well. It's always here in the bottom corner. So if you are having technical issues, whether something is not working correctly or you have found, um, or you just have, whatever issue you have with the learning site, you can get feedback on it through here. Um, notice there is a live phone support you can call 8.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time. You call that number and get a live person to talk you through whatever tech issues you're having. 
You can send an email to info at waysidepublishing.com. Um, another great easy way to provide feedback is with that feedback button. Here, if you have an idea or a suggestion for how something you would like to see on the learning site, maybe an improvement or, or having a certain activity function in a different way, you can give general feedback right here. You just type your feedback and hit send. The tech team will receive that message. They know it's from you because it's connected to your account. So if you have, a, so if they need to get in touch with you about your question or comment, they can do so. Um, if you use that drop down menu, you can also give feedback on any mistakes that you see in the learning site. And if something's not working properly, you can let them know that by using that drop down um, option and typing that in there. Let me get out of here. Okay, I'm just gonna. Oh, my computer. There we go. Okay, my computer is being a little slow. And the last um, thing I wanted to point out is this green toolbar up here and what is up here. So the dashboard, if you need to change classes, the dashboard takes you back to all of your class options. Okay. Um, codes are if you are assigning codes, if you don't have a single sign-on for your um, to assign students to your different courses, you will need that codes button, but you will get more information on that if you need that. This is where students go into their portfolio or where you can also go into your student's portfolio. There's a separate video all about the portfolio. Um, this is a great feature for teachers. It's called Learning Tools. And it's the Instructional Strategies Toolkit. So if you click on that, it's going to take you to our page where we have all different kinds of teaching ideas and strategies in the different modes of communication. Um, you can search by mode of communication, by skill, by proficiency level, etc. You have all these options to choose from. And you can see just a selection of some of those teaching strategies. The 3 2, one exit ticket how to activate prior knowledge, um, using affinity mapping, agreement circles. So lots of different ideas here to differentiate, to mix things up a little bit in your class, strategies for heritage speakers, um, et cetera. So take some time to explore the learning tools. Uh, here we have the iOS app. If your students are using an iPhone or an iPad, um, they will need to download that iOS app, which is free for them to use, but it um, helps the uh, the program work better on iPhones and iPads. This button here, what's new? Anytime something new is launched, there's information about it here. You can see that the last thing that was launched was the Instructional Strategies Toolkit here. So there's a message about that. And then when you're done, you can log out um, with that button there. So that is an overview of the Explorer section of the learning site where all of your activities are housed, where you go in to assign these activities to your students, and where you go in to grade as well. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at info at waysidepublishing.com and let us know how we can help you use the learning site and the Explorer function of it um, even better. Thank you so much.